This is a system of three linear equations in three unknowns. We're going to solve it using elementary row operations and what's called back substitution. This process is also called Gaussian elimination. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson giving a more formal introduction to Gaussian elimination if you're interested. In order to use any elementary row operations to solve this system, we need to represent the system with a matrix. For that, we use what's called an augmented matrix. What we're going to do is store the coefficients of the first variable in the first column of the matrix. We'll store the coefficients of the second variable in the second column, and so on. We also put the constants in a column on the right. Completing that process gets us this augmented matrix. For example, you can see the coefficients of x2 are 1, negative 2, and negative 7. And so we see in column 2 of our augmented matrix, 1, negative 2, and negative 7. Often a vertical line like this is used in an augmented matrix to separate coefficients from constants, but it isn't necessary. Now if we were trying to solve this system of equations just using the equations, there are various things we could do, like multiply an equation by a constant that's not zero, or add multiples of one equation to another to try to eliminate a variable. These are all things we can also do with the matrix, and these actions are called elementary row operations. They will change the matrix into a form that we prefer, but they certainly don't change the solution to the system that the matrix represents. We can multiply a row by a non-zero constant interchange two rows, and add a multiple of one row to another. So we're going to perform these operations on this augmented matrix until each non-zero row has a leading one. Then we'll be able to use back substitution to finish solving the system. Let me show you what I mean. Here is our augmented matrix. Like I said, for each non-zero row, we want its leading entry to be positive one. This first row already has a leading entry of positive 1, so that's great. One other thing we need to do is get zeros below any leading 1. So this leading 1 needs to have zeros below it. To accomplish that, we'll add one copy of row 1 to row 2, which I've written there, and we'll subtract three copies of row 1 from row 3. Those two things will turn this negative 1 and this 3 both into a zero. And we see that in this resulting matrix. Negative one plus one times one is zero. Negative two plus one times one is negative one. And three plus one times two is five. One plus one times eight is nine. As for row three, three minus three times one is zero. Negative seven minus three times one is negative 10. Four minus three times two is negative two. And 10 minus three times a is negative 14. All right, so we have this leading one in row one with zeros below it. Now we'll move on to row two. We want row two's first non-zero entry to be positive one. Right now, it's negative one. So we'll multiply row two by negative one to turn this first non-zero entry into a positive one. And that gets us here. Now this is a positive one. And of course, this five has become negative five and nine is now negative nine. So we've got a positive one at the beginning of row two, just like we want, but we also need to get a zero below it now. So to accomplish that, we will add 10 copies of row two to row three. Thus, this negative 10 will be canceled out. And doing that gets us to this matrix here. Negative 10 plus 10 times one is zero. Negative two plus 10 times negative five is negative 52. And negative 14 plus 10 times negative nine is negative 104. Finally, we want this first non-zero entry in row three to be a positive one. So we'll multiply row three by negative one over 52 to turn this into a positive one. And that gets us here. That negative 52 is now positive one and negative 104 times negative one over 52 is positive two. So this is exactly where we were trying to get. 
each row in this case happens to be non-zero, so each row has positive one as its first non-zero entry, and all of those leading ones have zeros below them. We also have it that each leading one occurs to the right of the previous leading one. So this matrix is now in what we call row echelon form, and by converting the rows back into equations, we're going to be able to solve the system. And that looks like this. Row 1 tells us that x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 equals 8. Row 2 tells us that 1x2 minus 5x3 equals negative 9. And row 3 tells us plainly that x3 is equal to 2. Now, the back substitution process is to take this variable, whose value we know, and plug it into the previous equation. So we're going backwards. And then that equation will tell us what x2 is. So then we can plug our value for x3 and x2 into equation 1, that first equation, and thus solve for that final remaining variable. Plugging x3 equals 2 into the second equation, we get that x2 minus 5 times 2 equals negative 9. So adding 10 to both sides, we find that x2 equals 1. Plugging x2 equals 1 and x3 equals 2 into the first equation, we have that x1 plus 1 plus 2 times 2 equals 8. And so, subtracting 5 from both sides, we have that x1 equals 3. And so that is the solution to this system. x3 equals 2, x2 equals 1, and x1 equals 3. Let's quickly do one more example. This one's a little bit different because it actually has infinitely many solutions. Here's our system of three equations in three unknowns. Notice in equation 2, there are no x2s, but there's some blank space left there just so everything lines up nicely. We can put this equation, or this system I should say, into an augmented matrix just like this. And then just as before, we can perform elementary row operations on this augmented matrix so that the leading entry in each non-zero row is positive 1. By going through that same process as before, we end up with this matrix. You can see that in this case, we do have a row of zeros, but the non-zero rows both have positive 1, as their first non-zero entry. And as before, the ones occur to the right as we go down the matrix. Now row one gives us this equation and row two gives us this equation. In the previous example, row three told us the value for x3. But in this case, row 3 is all zeros. So in fact, there is no restriction on x3. Thus, we can let x3 equal an arbitrary parameter. x3 is what we call a free variable. We'll say that it equals t and t is free to be whatever it likes. Then we go through the same process as before, back substitution. x3 equals t, and we can plug that into the second equation and solve for x2, and then plug both of those things into the first equation to solve for x1, but it will all be in terms of t. Again, that's because x3 is free to be whatever it likes, that value t. And then the values of x2 and x1 would be calculated accordingly. Now, if x3 equals t, then x2 must equal 2 plus 3 times t. If x2 equals 2 plus 3 times t, then x1 must equal this. This is 3 plus 5t and then minus x2, so minus 2 plus 3t. We can then combine like terms to have the x1 equals 1 plus 2t. And so this system has infinitely many solutions. We've just solved it with back substitution. We found that x3 is free to be whatever value t that it likes, and from there, x1 is equal to 1 plus 2t, and x2 is equal to 2 plus 3t. Any triple of values like this is going to be a solution of the system. Any real number t can be chosen, and you can get another solution. So that's how to solve systems of linear equations using a 
augmented matrices, elementary row operations, and back substitution. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my Linear Algebra course and Linear Algebra Exercises playlists in the description for more. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out lately. Don't know what's what, don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what's